we will spend the next few minutes discussing DNA structure and replication. The main topics we'll focus on are listed on the screen there, namely evidence for DNA as genetic material and the basic mechanisms behind DNA replication. For quite a while, uh, people knew that the nucleus contained proteins, RNA, and DNA, and the question was, well, what is the genetic material? They also knew for a while that the nucleus contained the genetic material based on earlier experiments. And so, of course, we now know that DNA is genetic material, but how do we know? What experiments led to that ultimate conclusion? Just a few examples of classic experiments addressing this basic question will be shown on the next few slides. So first of all, this is some work done by Griffith in 1928, and he was working with mice and also bacterium known as Streptococcus pneumoniae, or simply Strep pneumoniae. Uh, recognize up front that there are two strains of Strep pneumoniae, a rough strain shown here, with red cells, and a smooth strain, also with red cells, but surrounded by a gelatinous smooth sheath, uh, composed of some lipid, uh, some various polysaccharides. And so also notice that if a rough strain is in injected to a mouse, the mouse lives. He might get sick, but he lives. If a smooth strain is injected into a mouse, the mouse dies. So even though they're the same species of bacterium, these different strains give radically different results when injected into mice. And so also notice in the third panel here that if you kill, if you boil basically, if you kill the smooth strain, the mice live. It doesn't kill them. And so what Griffith did was said, well, let's what if we what if we go one step farther? What if we mix living rough cells, again, these ones shown in red toward the far right, mix those with heat-killed smooth cells? What would happen? Well, he predicted, uh, and it makes sense, he predicted the mice would live. After all, we saw earlier that the rough strain by itself and the heat-killed smooth strain by itself did not kill the mice. But when he did his experiment, the mice died. Not only that, but from the dead mice, he could recover living smooth strains of the bacterium. And so what, what was going on here? Uh, well, it must have been that something, some molecules inside these heat-killed smooth cells were able to transform or convert these living rough cells, again shown in red, into living smooth cells. So this is the basic concept of transformation or bacterial transformation. So bacteria have a variety of ways of introducing genetic variation, and transformation is just one of those ways. They can simply take up back, uh, uh, DNA from their surrounding environment and use that DNA as part of their genetic material. Other, other experiments sort of took off uh, based on Griffith's work. So here we're looking at the work of Avery, McCarty, and McCloyd in the early to mid-1940s. And they basically said, well, let's decide using, again, using this, this strep pneumonia uh, system, let's decide or, or let's test which type of molecule serves as a genetic material. So their setup was as follows. They took heat killed smooth cells like we see here and they basically separated those into three different batches. In one batch they added enzymes that destroyed proteins, another batch they added enzymes that destroyed RNA, and the third batch they added enzymes that destroyed the DNA. They then mixed those with living rough cells, the red ones here, and then looked to see which of these three were able to be transformed by the heat killed smooth cells. And as you might guess, the only ones that were not be that were not able to be transformed were those cells in which the enzymes that destroyed the DNA was added. So again, if you look at the bottom panel, panel, if you destroy the DNA, then no transformation can take place. The other batches, whether you destroy the protein or the RNA, doesn't matter as long as you have functional DNA, then those cells can be transformed. So that sort of led to the conclusion that it's likely DNA and not RNA or proteins that's serving as the genetic material. Another classic experiment was the Hershey Chase experiments, now we're into the 1950s. They essentially addressed the same basic question as follows. They worked with phage particles, so these are viruses that have the ability to infect bacteria. And they took one batch of phages and grew them in radioactive phosphorus. So in that batch, shown here on the left in red, the DNA was radioactive. The other batch they grew in radioactive sulfur. 
and sulfur is a component of proteins. So in that batch, the proteins were radioactive. And it turns out in these viruses, in these phage particles, the DNA is on the inside, and it is totally surrounded by these uh, proteins, uh, which are basically all comp uh, all make up the, the capsid. So the capsid is this outer coat of the phage particles. So they had these two batches of phages, one with radioactive DNA, one with radioactive protein. They let them go ahead and infect bacteria. That's what we see here. They then took the their 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 samples and put them in a blender, literally just to, to shake them up quite a lot and shake off all of the the phage particles from the exterior region of the bacteria. They then took their samples, put them in tubes, and centrifuged them. So they spun them down. And basically what you get is at the bottom you get a pellet uh, that consists of all of the bacterial cells. And all of the viral capsids, those proteins, they remain suspended in solution in the liquid part of the, of the tube. So then they simply tested each region uh, of these samples for activity. So what they found was is that this batch on the left, where radioactive DNA was used uh, to, to grow up the, the phage particles, the bacterial pellet was radioactive. Why? Well, again, because the phage particles had radioactive DNA that they then inf injected into the bacteria. They didn't find any radioactivity in the liquid portion. On the right, again, the batch where the bacteria had radioactive, sorry, the phages had radioactive proteins, they found radioactivity in the solution because that's where the capsid proteins were located, but none in the bacterial capsid again, indicating that the proteins were not injected into the bacteria. So again, Hershey-Chase experiment, another classic, again, ultimately leading to the conclusion that DNA was the genetic material and not RNA or proteins. And so once people knew that DNA was a genetic material, then what can we learn about its structure and function? 1950s, uh, Watson and Crick finished up their work and published on the structure of DNA. This was a short paper published in Nature, again in 1953, um, but it had profound consequences in our understanding of, of genetic material and fundamental genetics. They, so Watson and Crick, they didn't do a lot of experiments themselves, but they relied on lots of data from other people. And so just as one example, this is data from Shargaff, who basically took a bunch of different organisms, shown in the table toward the bottom here, and he just measured the amounts of A's, T's, G's, and C's in each of these organisms. And he noticed some very distinct uh, patterns based on his results. And so his his conclusions, or you might say the Shargaff's rules, um, which again, were, were, which were used by Watson and Crick as they were working out the structure of DNA, Shargaff concluded that the total amount of purines, namely the amount of A's plus G's, always equaled the total amount of pyrimidines, T plus C. Again, it didn't matter which species or which organism you're looking at. They also recognized that the amount of T always equaled the amount of A, and the amount of C always equal the amount of G. So again, this all makes sense now in light of our current understanding of the structure of DNA. But what you have to appreciate is that Watson and Crick used these types of data, again, to put together how DNA is likely structured. So now let's turn attention to the mechanism by which DNA is replicated during the S phase of the cell cycle. At the time, there were three possibilities or three hypotheses. Uh, on one hand, if we start with the original piece of DNA, the two strands could separate, each strand serving as a template, a template for new DNA shown in red. So that we, we call that the semi-conservative hypothesis. Another possibility, well, perhaps the original DNA is retained as the DNA is replicated into two new copies. A third possibility, the so-called dispersive model, our original DNA um, ends up as large chunks interspersed with newly formed DNA, again, in each of the two copies of DNA that are produced. So these were three hypotheses at the time. And of course, we now know that it's semi-conservative in nature, but how do we know? What experimental evidence uh, backs up this hypothesis, namely semi-conservative, as being the correct mechanism. Well, this is a, another classic experiment, the Messelson-Stahl experiment. And it goes something like this. Messelson and Stahl, they used a system where they had E. coli, 
so using bacteria. And they can grow that E. coli in medium with either heavy nitrogen and 15 is just a heavy isotope of nitrogen. And so the idea is every time DNA is synthesized, of course, it needs to take in nitrogen, right? Think about the nitrogenous bases. So the DNA produced with heavy nitrogen literally is heavier, it's more dense, than DNA produced with light nitrogen, or N14, shown here in the red colored medium. So they basically grew bacteria initially in N15. And then at that point, you can imagine if you took a sample, put it in a tube, centrifuged it, what you're going to see is the DNA will settle out at some point, right? like we see to the far right here. So that band there corresponds to the N15 DNA. They can then let those bacteria divide a certain number of times because, of course, they knew how long it took the cells to divide after they put them in new medium. So transfer initially from N15, then put the bacteria into N14, let them go for a few generations, and again, remove samples at each time. And what they could do is make predictions based on each of the three hypotheses. So again, initially, if you just took a sample, um, spun it down, you'd get a band at the N15 mark. Okay, so we call that generation zero. And again, of course, that's the same for all three hypotheses. Again, because you're all starting with the same point. But then if you let those bacteria undergo one round of cell division after being placed in N14, and then another round uh, also uh, after being in N14, again, we can make some predictions. So again, keep in mind the new DNA is shown in red. And so if we look at the semi-conservative model, after one round of cell division, so generation one, we would predict each DNA is half old and half new. That would give us one band right here at the hybrid zone. Let that go for another round of cell division. Again, all of the, the, the DNA is going to replicate. And what we're going to find is that, again, you're going to, for each piece of DNA, it will, the two strands will separate. And you'll retain half of your original, half and half will be newly formed DNA. And so what that would give us is essentially what we see in the lower left here. So we would end up with some DNA being hybrid. So that would show up a band in the middle and some DNA being totally in the N14 version because all the new DNA again is formed in, by, uh, by incorporating N14. So that would give us a band a little higher in our tube. Okay. So what you can then do is do the same thing for the conservative model and the dispersive model. And what you'll see is that the predicted banding at generations one and two give us three explicitly different patterns of banding, for, again, for these three different models. And so when they did the experiment, of course, what they found was, well, their, their results uh, actually matched up exactly with what you would predict based on the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. And the results, again, are shown toward the bottom here. So again, very conclusive evidence that DNA replication is semi-conservative in nature. Other experiments at the time, uh, for example, John Cairns, he was doing experiments also with E. coli. Uh, he was growing bacteria in radioactive thymidine. So the idea is anytime new DNA is synthesized, it will incorporate uh, radioactive thymidine. And basically what he did was he took bacteria, he grew them in radioactive thymidine, and so he could then take those bacterial cells, split them open, put them on a microscope slide, and then place a piece of photographic film over top of that slide. And so anywhere there's radioactivity, that would expose the film much like light would. And so what he found was that if he let the cells just undergo one round of cell division, so one round of DNA replication, you can literally get a picture much like you see on the far left. And the interpretation is, well, that's a piece of DNA uh, which consists of half of the original piece of DNA in blue and half in, in yellow. Also notice that it's, it's circular. So this was kind of intriguing. This was confirming that DNA in bacteria is circular in nature, unlike the linear chromosomes that we find in eukaryotes. If you let them divide a second time, he also found images, much like you see toward the third panel here, where you have this thicker line appearing at different stages. So you might have a line right here. Um, let it go a little bit longer before you took your sample. The line might be over here and so forth. And so again, what these are confirming 
are the results by Messelsenstahl, namely that this pattern that we see here, again, also aligns with the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. And again, you can see the interp interpretation uh, of, of the images that they see, again, in the sketches in this panel as well. So it became clear that DNA replication is semi-conservative in nature. And so then the next step was to dive a little more deeper and see exactly how this all takes place and what proteins and enzymes are involved in this process. So first of all, just keep in mind that when new DNA is synthesized, the complementary bases are added in a five prime to three prime direction. Also, interestingly enough, when the two strands of DNA separate, before DNA replication can begin, a small piece of RNA is produced and it serves as a primer. And it's on that primer that new DNA bases can be added. So what we're looking at here are some sketches of, uh, of what's taking place during DNA replication. So imagine a piece of DNA being unwound in a left to right fashion. That's what's illustrated here. Uh, again, keep in mind, new bases are added in a 5 to 3 direction. The yellow that we see here, these are small pieces of RNA that serve as a primer. So notice on one strand, once an RNA primer is produced, new DNA bases, shown in red, can be added. And on this particular strand, this will be continuous. As long as the DNA is unwound left to right, new DNA can be added continuous pretty much all the way to the end of the chromosome. But on the, so it, we call that strand the leading strand. On the other strand, we call this the lagging strand. Why? Well, because notice, again, it all comes down to being added in a five to three direction. So once an RNA primer is produced here, new bases can be added toward the left, because that would be the five to three direction. And imagine, coming back a little bit later, let's focus on the bottom now, so the DNA is unwound some more. Now we have this gap right here, so another piece of RNA might be produced right here. And then again, new DNA bases can be added toward the left to fill in the gap. That essential, unfortunately, it's, it's not illustrated all the way down, but we call this the lagging strand. And what will happen is that that DNA that on that fragment will be replicated in fragments and large sections all the way down the length of the DNA. And you end up with these fragments we call Okazaki fragments that essentially have to be fixed or modified a bit before DNA replication is complete. And so we'll talk about that in just a moment. So now let's just talk about the basic enzymes and proteins involved in this process. Just a quick review helicase. That's the enzyme that separates the two strands and unwinds the DNA. Once the DNA is separated into two strands, there are these SSBPs or single strand binding proteins that come into play and prevent the two strands from snapping back together. Primase then is the enzyme that synthesizes the small piece of RNA that serves as a primer. One, this is all occurring when helicase is unwinding the DNA. There's lots of tensions and kinks that can be produced in the, in the DNA molecule itself. So topoisomerase simply is an enzyme that um, basically breaks the DNA, allows it to swivel, releasing that tension. Then DNA polymerase 3 is the main enzyme that comes in and essentially adds DNA bases, linking them onto the end of the RNA primer that was produced earlier. Then think about those Okazaki fragments. DNA polymerase 1, shown here in yellow, it comes along later, and it then removes all of those RNA bases and replaces them with DNA bases. And then finally, DNA ligase, this is an enzyme that comes along and simply seals the gap. So toward the bottom, this light blue enzyme, you'll notice there's a gap between these two adjacent DNA bases. DNA ligase simply forms a bond between those adjacent bases, thus completing the production of a complete piece of DNA. So think about that system and think about what happens at the end of chromosomes. Uh, there are important regions at the end of our chromosomes called telomeres. And it turns out, well, and I'll mention the enzyme too, so there's also an enzyme called telomerase, which helps to extend the length of our chromosomes. Why is that important? Well, Let's focus toward the, toward the bottom here. Imagine the end of a chromosome. Again, if there's a piece of RNA that serves as a template, uh, you can come along and remove that RNA, but then notice what you're gonna get is essentially 
an unreplicated portion at the end of our chromosome. And the reason that is because there's nothing sort of here toward the far right for new DNA bases to be added to, in other words, to fill in this, this portion right here. So we end up with a potential problem, right? So if every time our cells divide, or every time DNA replication occurs, the ends of our chromosomes have the potential to get shorter and shorter. And so telomerase is simply the enzyme uh, shown here in green that extends the ends of our chromosomes so that doesn't become a, a problem generation after generation. So telomerase simply has a, a piece of RNA that it serves as a template so it links on to the end of this unreplicated portion of the chromosome. It extends that chromosome and then later on new DNA bases can be added like they normally would and so therefore not in all of our cells, this, this, this doesn't work in all of our cells, but in many of our cells where telomerase is active, uh, that again extends the length of our chromosomes so that they remain fully functional generation after generation. And so that concludes our brief discussion of DNA replication.